78 years ago, a grotesquely bizarre killing sparked one of Britain's greatest murder mysteries. Sunday, April 18, 1943, on a chill spring day in the rural Midlands area of England, four teenage boys by the names of Thomas Willits, Bob Farmer, Fred Payne, and Robert Hart were poaching in the woods when they got the shock of their lives. Hagley Wood is located just outside of Stourbridge in Worcestershire and lies between Birmingham and Kidderminster. One of the boys, Bob Farmer, left the others and went to the stump of an old elm tree. As he looked in, he saw a skull. Bob let out a piercing scream. At first, he thought it was an animal skull, an opossum perhaps. When he noticed the metal fillings in the teeth and the fabric beneath the bones, he realized he had come upon a skull that belonged to a human. Bob later recalled, there was a small patch of rotting flesh on the forehead with lank hair attached to it. The two front teeth were crooked. He called his friends and one of them raked the skull out of the tree with a stick and put it back again. The boys immediately panicked. They were on the land illegally and they were afraid of being punished for trespassing. As if in a scene from a coming of age movie, he and his companions vowed to forget what they found and tell no one about it. This will prove to be easier said than done because hours after his conscience began tormenting him, the youngest boy, Tommy Willits, confessed everything to his father who immediately called the police. Professor J.M. Webster, director of the West Midland Forensic Science Laboratory was called to the scene. The tree trunk was opened out and Webster was able to reconstruct the skeleton. It was discovered that the victim was a female. No evidence of violence upon any of the bones were found. However, a piece of taffeta cloth was stuffed deep in the cavity of the mouth, which may have been the cause of death. Webster did not imagine anyone getting into the tree voluntarily. One of the victim's hands had been severed and buried at the foot of the tree. The coroner declared cause of death asphyxiation and estimated the time of death to be around October of 1941, a year and a half before her body's discovery. Webster found that the corpse was still warm when placed in the tree and that the asphyxiation had been caused by the plug of taffeta. Worcestershire Constabulary circulated the information they had around and posted notices in the main dental journals of the time because of the woman's irregularly aligned teeth. They checked with reports of women missing locally and followed up with various leads, but were not able to definitely link any of them with the remains. Her age is thought to be between 25 and 40, probably 35. Five feet tall with light brown hair and dressed in dark blue and mustard colored striped cardigan and mustard colored skirt, blue crepe and sole shoes size five and a half. The garments on her body were of poor quality and a wedding ring found among the bones were made of road gold. She had given birth at least once. No one in the immediate area knew who she was. It was a small rural community where everyone knew everyone. They wanted to know her identity, but despite hundreds of leads being followed by police, her identity was not established. The inquest returned the verdict, murder by some person or persons unknown. Despite a detailed description of the woman, no one could remember ever seeing her in the area. She had extremely distinctive teeth. There were no matching dental records that matched hers anywhere. As with many unexplained deaths, the community's gossip ran amok. In 1941, a report had been made about screams being heard in Hagley Wood. A search was conducted and nothing was found, so it was concluded that it was foxes. Could this be linked to the discovery of the body? Who was the mystery woman? Where had she come from? Why had no one come forward to identify her? Some speculated that whoever concealed the body was probably local because the fact that the witch elm was hollow wasn't something anyone who wasn't familiar with the community would know. Some thought she may have been part of a traveler com community camp for a short time in the area at the time. 
Some thought she was just a random murder victim who couldn't be identified because of the large number of displaced persons and refugees during wartime. It was even thought that she was a victim of a drunken escape gone wrong. Another theory was that she had been murdered by servicemen who hadn't served, survived the war or she had been murdered by the father of her child. In 1944, the case took an even weirder turn. Someone chalked on the wall of empty premises on Upper Dean Street, Birmingham. Who put Lubella down the witch elm? In the following weeks, the graffiti changed into who put Bella in the witch elm? It remained the same for over six decades. The evening dispatch declared on March 30th, 1944, the writing was too high on the wall to have been done by the boys and the police are inclined to view that it is the work of someone coming into the city early in the morning with farm produce. The identity of the writing's author was never uncovered. Professor Margaret Murray of University College in London posited that the death resembled a black magic execution and suggested witches were responsible. Murray's argument was that the severed hand was the definitive clue and cited the hand of glory practice where a hand would be severed from a hanged criminal and used for a variety of magical purposes. Another theory that was more credible to the police 10 years later was brought to their attention by a columnist named Wilfred Bifford Jones. Bifford Jones had started writing a series of articles about the case in the Express and Star newspaper under the pen name Quester. Not long after the articles ran, several letters came to the papers, one of them from a woman named Anna Claverly, who claimed to have information about the murder. According to Anna, Bella was a foreign spy who had been part of a ring scouting out munition factories in the area and reporting back to the Luftwaffe. Bella was Dutch and had accidentally learned too much about a British officer who was a mole involved in the spy ring. The officer and another spy killed Bella before dumping her body in the woods. Her letter named the officer and upon further investigation revealed that he died in a mental ward in 1942, months after Bella's murder. Anna met with Bifford Jones and the police. She told them the tale of a group of pro-German conspirators passing on intelligence about munitions and aircraft factories in the West Midlands. One of them was Anna's ex-husband. Anna suggested that Bella was Dutch and part of a spy ring operating in the area. She also linked a Dutchman called Van Ralt, an associate her, of her ex-husband with Bella's death. She claimed that her ex-husband was present when Bella was put in the tree and was haunted by what had happened. Some of Anna's claims were verified by MI5 and another writer investigating the situation later published a book claiming that a Dutch spy named Johannes Dronkers who was executed by the British in 1942, had a wife named Clara Bella, who was in her 30s and had unusual teeth. A wife who disappeared prior to his capture. The public became convinced that Bella had either been a spy or mixed up with spies. It was said that Czech-born Gestapo agent Joseph Jacobs, captured by the Home Guard in 1941 at the parachuting into Cambridgeshire, gave interrogators her name and picture. She was the spy's lover, Clara Bowerly, a German actress and cabaret singer. Prior to the war, she spent two years working in West Midlands music halls and had mastered a broomy accent. Clara had been recruited by the Gestapo and with Jacobs was given the job of creating a spy cell over in the area. The pair never made contact. Interestingly enough, no showbiz record of Clara, no films, billboards, or record of engagements exists after spring 1941. She simply disappeared off the face of the earth. The spy ring theory gained more traction when MI5 published some of the wartime files. Interest became centered on Joseph Jacobs, an enemy agent who was arrested after parachuting into Cambridgeshire in 1941. Jacobs had a photograph of the German singer and actress Clara Bowerly. 
He said that Clara was a secret agent who was to have parachuted into the Midlands. There have been several people who have linked the names Clara Bowerly and Clara Bella and speculated that Bella was Clara Bowerly. This is an angle that is still being explored today. Other theories swirled around. There were those who believed that Bella was a prostitute who had picked up the wrong John. Some believed that she had been a refugee fleeing from the Blitz and had met a rapist in the woods. Some believed that she was a gypsy murdered by her tribe for some horrible misdeed. Every few years some fresh graffiti emerges or another theory will reactivate interest in the case. Unfortunately, there was simply not much to go on. Three years ago, Caroline Wilkinson, the professor of craniofacial identification at Dundee University used photographs taken at the time to recreate Bella's face. She did the rebuilding of Richard the Third's face after his remains were found under a Leicester car park. She could not use the actual skull because the police lost it. Sadly, a spokesperson for the West Midlands Police announced that searches have been conducted by the Police Museum volunteers and they have confirmed that we hold no exhibits and can find no documentation that may relate to this case at either of the West Midlands Police Museums. Additionally, searches were carried out by our force records team who have confirmed that there is no relevant documentation held with the major investigation team or in exter external storage. The skull dates back to a time when Hagley fell within the West Midlands police boundary. As decades have passed, times have changed. This has not been the case for many years. It had been housed at Birmingham Forensics Labs, then moved to the police city based Tally Ho on a Pershore Road. It's doubtful that anyone who actually knows what happened is still alive. If there is such a person, they have not come forward. In 2005, West Mercia Constabulary conducted a review of the case and re-examined all available evidence. They came to the decision that there was no clear investigative leads to be pursued. Close the case and the surviving files be transferred to Worcestershire's County Archives. The files are now a part of the criminal records of the Marches Project to catalog the archives of West Mercia Police held at the Hive. All of this is alleged. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.